Walk Across America Summaries, Chapter 1, Talking by a Wood Stove. In this chapter, we get introduced to Peter Jenkins and get to know what he is doing. It takes place sometime during Peter's journey. Tommy, Doc, and several other men in a country store and a giant blizzard first confront Peter. Tommy and the Doc ask him what the devil he's doing hiking across America, and Peter tells him that he is doing it to get to know the country. Tommy offers Peter to come to his house for some food, but Peter rejects. Peter calls for his dog, Cooper. A thin farmer gives Peter $5 in case he needs it. Peter and Cooper then leave the store and go into the giant blizzard. Peter then tells us how Cooper saved him one time before the walk. Peter and Cooper were hiking along an 11 mile alternate training route when Cooper killed a snake that would probably have bitten Peter. We then get introduced to some of Peter's background. This so-called walk across America was something that was brewing in Peter's mind for a long time. Peter tells us that he grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut. This is a town of about 60,000 with manicured homes and country clubs. Its high level of income and social status made Peter think that he had to attend Yale or Harvard. In Greenwich, you were considered a greaser if you drove a Corvette or had a Harley Davidson motorcycle. Most people drove country squire wagons or BMWs. Peter's problem, according to him, was that he thought that all towns in America were like Greenwich. Peter tells us that he suffers from a hollowness deep inside him that does not go away. It comes back after beer, booze, or drugs wear off from a party. It didn't go away after he skied in Shalott in Stowe, Vermont, a revival of Woodstock, which took place during the summer of his senior year in high school. That didn't bring him any relief either. College and being by himself made the hollowness intensify. Peter himself began to wonder what he was doing hiking in a blizzard. Chapter two, Mount California. The majority of this chapter tells of Peter's past and begins with Peter's memories of college, which he finished just eight months ago. Peter tells us that he signed up for an art class, which he at first thought was for the girls and femi guys. John Wood was Peter's art teacher. Peter was transferred from the liberal arts college to the College of Arts, where he became a sculptor, glass blower, and potter. He centered his work on clay. Peter would stay up until 3 a.m. dancing and having beer chugging contests. He was excited by the young ladies, Becky, Chris, Joanne, Marianne, etc. But he was mostly interested in a girl from his hometown who went to a Philadelphia college. She had sent him a love letter inviting him to see her in Philly. He never saw her during the first four years of high school because she was sent to a prep school geared to getting students into Ivy League schools. She had sent him another letter after prep school. They made phone calls to each other until she was transferred to Alfred University with Peter. They got an apartment under their favorite sub shop and they eventually got married in 1971. They moved into a third floor apartment at 51 North Main Street in Alfred. Their relationship began to crumble and they separated on May 30th, 1973. She returned to her parents in Greenwich and Peter left to live alone with Cooper. Peter became an assistant electrician to pay his rent at the apartment and decided that it would be best to leave everyone and everything that he knew. His first idea was to travel from Alaska to the tip of South America on motorcycle. If he couldn't make the money, he would become a rancher in Utah or Wyoming. Peter asked his step-grandmother, Rhonda Jenkins, if he could have $2,000, but she refused. So Peter sent a letter to a Utah sheep rancher. The rancher told Peter that Cooper would have to stay behind. So Peter decided not to go. Peter became very bothered with the things going on in America, including drugs and American soldiers going to Vietnam. Blacks in the South were in a quiet war as rednecks were trying to wipe them out and communism was bothering him. The most troublesome thing to Peter was the industrial power destroying the environment. Peter told Stu Weigand, an Alfred security guard, that he and his wife split up and told him that he wants to leave America. Stu told Peter to give America one last chance, and that is how Peter got the idea to walk across America. Cliff Dubriel, a track and cross country coach, told, told Peter to train for his walk by walking slash running a cross country route every day. Peter began to think about Cooper, who often attacked people at the sub shop for food. Peter told Cooper that he was fat, but Cooper didn't seem to care. Peter and Cooper climbed a hill. Peter was ready to go home, but Cooper wanted to keep going. Peter named the mountain that he climbed for training Mount California. By July, Peter and Cooper were covering five miles in about eight minutes a mile. On July 5th, Peter saw a marathon runner passing him on the mountain, causing Peter to almost think about quitting. On August 2nd, Peter and Cooper made it to the top of the mountain. After a swim, Peter decided that he would begin his journey. On October 15th, 1973, Peter bought some equipment from the Alpine Design brand since that was the best that he could afford. Peter would call home only once under special circumstances. Peter packed all that he needed, including the things that he, as well as many Americans, thought were the most important 
blue jeans. Chapter three, walking into the country. This chapter covers the first part of Peter's walk across America, mostly in Pennsylvania. Peter first tells us that Cooper is a hide and seek champion. Peter's equipment arrives and on October 15th, about 50 people, as well as Cooper's girlfriend lab, Satch, come to say goodbye. Cooper once got embarrassed with Satch in downtown Alfred. Peter left and gave a 64 blue Chevy to his younger brother, Scott. Cooper became out of hand and attacked chickens. Charlie, a friend, and Scott went with Peter the first night. They slept well next to the Appalachian River. When Peter's new alarm clock, the sun, woke them up, Scott and Charlie left. Peter promised that he would follow two laws. One, a Sioux law, is with all beings and all things, we shall be as relatives. The second is one that Peter made up seeing many spots where deer had bedded down for the night, which said, every morning we will leave our campsite as a deer would, with only a few hundred bent blades of grass to show that we have been there. The first week on the walk was what Peter called his shakedown cruise. Peter didn't want to become mileage crazy, which is a condition that vehicle drivers get, worrying about how many miles are they are traveling rather than on the reason for traveling. While in Pennsylvania, Cooper attacks a porcupine with unfortunate results. This had happened before during training and a vet had given Peter some pills that would knock Cooper out. Peter used these pills and a man used some pliers and got the quills out of Cooper. Cooper kept chasing animals, but never porcupines. Peter's goal was to get to Washington, DC. Peter and Cooper settled at a pine scented campsite and heard the sounds of oh, scaring Peter. After waking Peter, went to a country store and bought food for himself and Cooper. Two Pennsylvania game wardens, one fat and one thin, came over to Peter and asked what he was doing and laughed when Peter said he was walking across America. Peter asked him what that sound he heard was last night. The thin warden said that it was a UFO visitor, but the large beer belly warden said that it was probably a white-tailed buck not used to campers. Peter asked them what the best back route to Maryland and Washington was, and they gave him directions. Peter and Cooper went on top of Wagoner's Gap, and Peter, after soaring with birds, said that nothing would ever leash down his freedom walking across America. Peter eventually crossed the Pennsylvania-Maryland border and was closing in on Washington, D.C. Chapter four, a new Nikon. This chapter takes place in Washington, D.C. Peter has an appointment with a writer at the National Geographic Society. A watchman at the National Geographic headquarters took Peter and Cooper to see Mr. Harvey Arden. Peter's goal was to get his walk published in the National Geographic magazine. He had to hurry because winter was coming. Mr. Arden took Peter and Cooper to the editor, Mr. Gil Grosvenor, to see if it could be published. Cooper had made a mess with the editor's room, embarrassing Peter, but the editor didn't care. Peter told the editor about his walk and made sure that he knew that he didn't want any money from the magazine. Peter told him that he wants a camera and film. When Peter said that he expected the walk to be eight months long, the editor told him to take his time. That night, Peter and Cooper stayed at Harvey's house and the next day, Peter got one camera body and three lenses. Peter called home to see if his parents, brothers and sisters would meet him in Washington DC and they said yes. On the way to Harvey's house, Peter saw some Canadian geese, a sign that winter was coming. While going to West Virginia, Peter met his family. Of the six kids in his family, only three could make it. His two brothers, Scott and Freddie, had obligations and couldn't make it. His sister, Winky, came with her boyfriend, Randy, in a yellow VW bus. Cooper, Peter, and his family walked with each other for about two or three miles until Peter and Cooper left their group to go their separate ways. What hit P Peter the hardest was how his father looked at him. Chapter five, Thanksgiving and five red apples. This chapter takes place in Virginia, West Virginia, and then back in Virginia. The cold told Peter that he had to turn south and miss West Virginia. The Appalachian Trail was Peter's next destination, but he decided to leave it so he could see more Americans. Peter finally reached Charlottesville and bought some, bo some boots. Peter saw a sign telling people to be thankful since Thanksgiving was coming up. Peter was worried that he would be fearful in the outdoors because hunting season was coming up. Peter went into a country store and bought some of his own Thanksgiving food for both him and Cooper. When they found their place to eat, Peter made a fire and they ate. Peter's favorite treat, by the way, was cranberry sauce. Peter went to sleep after eating, but a deer hunter's gun woke him up. Peter grabbed Cooper and fled. They went to West Virginia and Peter saw the Greenbrier Inn, a place with wealthy tycoons. When they crossed back into Virginia, a big storm was threatening and it eventually came. It made it hard for Peter to keep going, but Cooper was having the time of his life with the snow, which Cooper loves. Peter went to sleep in his tent, which he pitched between two thickets. When he awoke, he let Cooper 
out to play in the snow, but Cooper crashed into the tent, covering it with snow, and rolled over Peter. Cooper licked Peter and knocked the tent over. Enraged, Peter threw a snowball at Cooper. Peter got dressed and took off, but Cooper again jumped on him. Peter threw another snowball at him. While continuing to walk, Peter walked over mountains until he came to one that almost made him want to quit. They pitched camp early and went to sleep. When they awoke, they continued to walk and Cooper made Peter worry. Peter saw a mountain that he thought could be Maneater Mountain, which had the town of Chatham Hill on the other side. They made it to the top. Suddenly, a VW bus with one man came up the mountain. The man told Peter that it was about three to four miles to the next door. The man gave Peter five red apples.